the last hour. The government has unveiled £266 million of investment in the UK's offshore wind turbine manufacturing industry, which is expected to create more than 1,000 jobs and increase renewable energy supply in the UK. Yeah, the boost comes as Milestone Climate Report warns of the devastating effects of burning fossil fuels. We're joined now by the Business and Energy Secretary, Kwasi Kwarteng. Uh, good morning to you, uh, Kwasi Kwarteng. I know you were just listening to Ben Whitaker there uh, talking about what he would do to try and win some votes That's for his right. political career. Uh, I think if it was as easy as offering uh, PlayStations for kids and shorter weeks, uh, then you'd all be doing it. Sadly, that isn't the case. But of course, one of the things you are facing, and we are facing as a, as a globe, is the climate, uh, the climate issue right now. Can you explain a little bit about this green initiative that you're announcing this morning? Um, and, and, and the idea that we're sort of going to build a lot more um, wind turbines in the Humber region, £266 million of government and private sector investment. So, as you say, Ben, the investment isn't uh, all uh, government money. Uh, most of it, in fact, is coming from the private sector. Uh, and the two companies involved are uh, GRI Renewables and uh, Siemens Gamisa. And what we're trying to do is obviously increase the amount of uh, wind power that we can generate. Uh, and that's been a really successful story over the last... 10 years, if you go back to 2012, something like 40% of the electricity that we enjoyed, that we consumed, was produced uh, essentially through burning coal. Uh, today, that figure is less than 2%. And the uh, vast majority of the, of the difference has been taken up by the fact that we've increased uh, offshore wind. Uh, and it's been very successful. And the investment that we're announcing today, uh, as I say, mostly private sector investment, um, is about uh, trying to increase uh, the amounts of power that we can generate uh, with offshore wind. And it, and, it, and it also creates, as you say, um, more than a 1,000 jobs uh, in the Humber area. Which is very welcome, I'm sure, for those in that area. And also, there will be many people celebrating the idea of investment, private or otherwise, going into wind power. We're also, as well as your announcement, aren't we, we're expecting the UN's intergovernmental mental panel on climate change announcement um, a report around 9 a.m. And it's expected in that report that the kind of temperature tipping point where we get to 1.5 uh, degrees Celsius up that people say is the point maybe of no return in terms of climate change. They're expected to bring it much sooner. Um, have we done enough when we sit down in Glasgow? Has this government done enough? Would you give your government, gold, silver or bronze? <laughs> well, look, I think we've done a uh, considerable amount as a country. It's not just this government. I mean, if you look at the last 31 years since 1990, we've reduced our carbon emissions by 45%. And that's a world-beating figure, as I've said. Uh, it, it's the, the, you'd be very, it'd be very hard for you to look at any other country that's reduced its carbon emissions to that extent. There's still a huge amount uh, to do. Uh, and there's still Have challenges. Have we do it soon enough? Have we done enough to make the difference? That's the problem. Because meanwhile, while you're announcing this investment in wind farms, there's also the really difficult problem of the Camba oil and gas field contracts. Of course, they were initially approved um, 20 years ago. Uh, you don't have the final say-so, but you could overrule them going ahead. And the idea for many people of new fossil fuel extraction you know, off on the seabed near Shetland at this time, albeit that it creates jobs and there are industries in the area that, you know, are dependent on that, is just plain wrong. We shouldn't so, be doing it. Keir Starmer is one of them. I Why are you not worried about doing it? So I think Keir Starmer is wrong. And, and Kate, I'll say this. The oil and gas sector today employs 250,000 people uh, in the UK. Any idea that we're just simply going to pull the plug on it and shut it down in, in an instance is, 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 doesn't make any sense whatsoever. So that was why, as energy minister, I negotiated a, a deal. It's called the North Sea Transition Deal. And the key word in that is transition. What we're doing is saying that we've got to transition the, the oil and gas sector uh, from being fossil fuel uh, focused to uh, a, a net zero uh, basis. And companies like Shell and BP, uh, among others, are also very focused on this. And that involves um, using some of the assets for things like carbon capture, which we're uh, doing, and we've got plans uh, to, to encourage investment in that. 
it also involves you know trying to um, use electricity on, on all um, platforms as well. And it's a transition. It's not something that's going to happen overnight. It's difficult. And so I think it's really, really important. It's difficult balance because, as you say, there's a lot of people that rely on that for Absolutely. business and the money, undoubtedly, for the economy. But as Oxfam have said, this Cambo field would release an estimated 132 million tonnes of CO2 emissions into the atmosphere. I mean, the, 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 the green and the environmental impact of this Cambo field, at a time when you were announcing a huge investment in wind turbines, as Kate said, we're about to get this report at nine o'clock, just talking about how crucial it is that climate uh, change is tackled, the COP26 happening in November in Glasgow. Are you comfortable mm -hmm. with this, uh, that, that the, the, sort of the, 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 the two things going together, that we are facing this climate crisis, and yet at the same time, you are going ahead with this huge oil field, which will have such a devastating impact on the environment. So I think there are a number of things there. I mean, yes, it's true that it's carbon emitting, but we're also investing, as I said earlier, in carbon capture. So if we can get a way of capturing that carbon um, uh, and, and essentially putting it in the, in the seabed, and there are lots of schemes to do that, um, okay, we will so go some way... Sorry, way forgive me. you deliver you'll... that, sorry, it would be to ensure that you made sure the technology for capturing was there before moving forward on this. And you know, I think the doing. problem for environmentalists is that there's been a lot of talk of technology that can help, of better recycling, of governments taking it seriously. But it seems that still the slide towards the industries that are doing the damage Continue. So maybe one thing you could say is, right, sort that technology first before we go ahead we have with got this. The technology. We've exactly got the technology. I speak to people in Teesside and Humberside, in in uh, in, in Merseyside, also um, in, around Peterhead. They've got they've got they've got the technology to cut to capture the carbon. What we have to do now is to incentivize it to make sure that it's an attractive offer for for investors to to develop uh, those sites. So the technology is there. And that's why, as uh, energy minister and also in my current job, I've, I've been very focused on trying to get investment into these carbon capture sites. And that's what's happening over the next few months. Uh, and I'm sure, um, you know, in the next year, we will be able to announce um, significant sites where we will have carbon capture and attract... Uh, the necessary investment for it. OK. A number of other things we'd like to talk to you about before we have mm -hmm. to let you go, unfortunately. The front of the Daily Mail this morning, the headline, Ministers cut the pay of civil servants who work at home. There's a drive in some civil service departments to get people back into work, into the office, at least three days a week. It seems extraordinarily harsh when they're being incentivised and told to stay at home and work at home that civil servants should have their pay cut. No. Uh, As a senior minister has said this, Kwasi Kwarteng, I'm sure it wasn't you, but this. what do you it think? It wasn't me, um, and I think it's the wrong policy. There's no suggestion that we're going to do that. Uh, what we want to do is to encourage people back into the office in a safe way. I mean, that's the thing, and people have to be comfortable about uh, coming into work. But there's no, there's no suggestion or, or has never been discussed, uh, you know, this is a notion that we can dock people's pay. I don't think that's right at all. So you don't know the, who the minister is? It's not you? Well, it said a, cab, a senior... I don't know what it said. It said a cabinet minister or a minister. It didn't say who it was. No, and no. and I, don't know, I don't know who the person uh, that they're quoting... Are any of your colleagues suggesting that the uh, civil servants have been having it easy because they've been sitting at home and they're not being sort of held to account because they're in their offices? Because that's, that's some of the suggestions in the article is that actually they've been allowed to get away with things because they're not being held to account because they're not in the office? Ben, all I can talk about is my department yeah. that I'm responsible for, and they've worked incredibly hard over the last six months uh, since I took over. I can, I, can, I can vouch for that. And people have been working from home, uh, sometimes under a lot of pressure, um, but they've never failed to come up with, with the goods uh, uh, to work in a collegiate way effectively. And also people coming into work are also working uh, very uh, efficiently and, and, and cr creating, making great results. So I don't really see a distinction, certainly in my experience, uh, in my department between people working from home and uh, people coming into work. I think there's a, a lot of focus uh, and people want to want to produce uh, and get good res good results. Okay. Now, I can't well, I'm speak sure the people in your department places. will be very relieved. Um, uh, we'll see if it emerges who the minister was and what I happens next. I really can't um, help you on that. Let's talk about ministers in other ways. Okay. Are you concerned about the relationship between the prime minister and the chancellor of the exchequer? It Not feels to be tense. Uh, there all. is reported in, in several places that he made, albeit a jokey comment, about maybe it's time for um, 
uh, Rishi Sunak to become health minister rather than chancellor. We know that there are loggerheads about all sorts of things, including a potential increase in national insurance to help fund the backlog for the pandemic and then onwards into social care. We know that they've been concerned, and he was very public about it, wasn't he, the Chancellor, about lifting restrictions and changing the way travel operates. Um, are you concerned? Because even on this programme this morning, we've had people say that when the Chancellor and the Prime Minister at loggerheads, the government falls, essentially. Look, you and I remember times when uh, the Chancellor and the Prime Minister um, have been almost at daggers drawn. This isn't one of those times. I think the Prime Minister and the Chancellor work very effectively together. I think they're a great team. I think the Chancellor has had uh, probably the most stressful job of any Chancellor since the war. Um, and he's performed extremely well. I enjoy working with him. I think he's a great colleague. And we're focused on dealing with the job at hand, which is getting through the pandemic. Uh, is there and any personal through... tension between them? Because Boris Johnson's approval with Conservative Home, the most recent survey of their personal approvals, was just over 1%, to nearly 2%. And uh, Rishi Sunak's was well above 74 Look, I, I don't think there's much... Um, uh, there's any uh, personal animus at all. I mean, you've got to remember the Prime Minister appointed Rishi uh, last year because he thought he'd do a great job. And I think the, 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 the appointment... Um, has been fully justified, and I think they're working very well uh, together. Okay, we'll leave it there, though. Quasi Quatin, thanks for joining us this morning.